So before I dive too much into this video, I am making watercolor swatches of all of my watercolors. I made myself a little template and I'm tracing all of that out so that way each color will be, will look identical as far as the way that I apply it to the paper. And I'm going to put all of these swatches once they're done on a big ring. And the name for it was just clips that I found in the Michaels jewelry section. So if you're looking for these big rings, I didn't know what they were called and they're just called clips, which is not very specific. So hopefully you can find these. Um, just Michaels jewelry section is where I got it. So if you wanted to do this as well, I highly recommend it. It was actually really fun and it is incredibly useful to be able to see all of these colors on the paper. And yeah, so the papers are um, Arches Cold Press Watercolor Paper is what I used for my swatches because that's basically what I use for my watercolors, so it made sense. I cut them to 2 by 4 inches, and in the upper right-hand corner I wrote the brand. DS is for Daniel Smith, MG is for M. Graham, and I believe there was another color that shows up somewhere in the reds that is a different brand, and I wrote that one up in the corner, but there's only one of those. So the majority of these are Daniel Smith um, and a few of them are M. Grams. The top bar is going to be the pure pigment um, straight out of the tube. It is not the way you normally use watercolor, but I wanted to see what it is at the very, very purest form of the paint. In the main section though is the purest pigment in the very top and then watered it down to the lightest that that pigment will go so that I can see how it gradates. This allows me to see most of the different values of the color and how light it gets and if there's any granulation and you'll see all of this. I'm going to show you a section at the very end that is not sped up so you get to see a good good look at how all of these paints uh, turn out once they dry. So I'm speeding through the part where I'm actually painting everything because it took me like hours and hours to do. So we're speeding through that right now. Uh, oh yeah, so back to what I wrote on the cards though. The bottom has the name of the color, the series, and sometimes the series will differ between brands. So I add the series in there. The light fastness, which is very important because that tells me how well the color is going to hold up over time and how well it will hold up, especially if it is in the daylight, which is most things because we want to see art. So it's important that if daylight is hitting a painting, it's not just going to fade away. At the beginning of the series, I did start writing down the pigment uh, name and like numbers and everything and then I stopped doing that because I realized I didn't really need it. It wasn't exactly useful for me. So some of them have the pigment written on there and then I just stopped doing that. So I mean you can include that if you did these if you wanted to do that. Um, but I had a lot of them to do and it was just a choice I made. So do it, don't do it. It's fine either way. At the beginning I did the duochromes and oh, the iridescent paints and so you'll see me uh, painting black lines like kind of a black bar on those first section or series of paints so that is because the duochromes and the iridescence work over the top of black paint really well so that way I wanted to see what the difference would look like when it's painted on pure white paper and when it's painted over black because two totally different looks to both of those and so that way you can see how the pigment reacts to black versus white and also how the mica react to being reflective and what color that mica is. So normally I would never have opted to have, I never planned I guess to have this many colors. I sort of established my palette and I stuck to those colors for a really long time and I never really felt like I needed more of them, but because our local Daniel Smith store was going out of business, I went, I stopped by, I can't resist looking at a bunch of cool paints and getting new art supplies, and because they were all, they were like 40% off, and so 
I went thinking that I was just going to maybe stock up on the colors that I normally use, but the colors that I normally use, and especially like here in the Seattle area, a lot of people here use blues in their watercolors just because it's like, I guess they're painting local landscapes and stuff. So all the blues were like wiped out pretty much. And I wanted to get extra paints and I thought, well, this might be a really good opportunity for me to test extra paints, even though I am buying full tubes, which isn't really the best way to go about testing for new paints. They were a very good price. So I basically grabbed a whole bunch that I thought looked very interesting. And I'm hoping that out of the ones that I grabbed, I might find a few new ones that I can add to my palette and will be useful. I'm especially interested to see any of them that are granulating because those are the ones that it's an effect that you can't really achieve just by mixing color. Like it has to be built into the paint itself. You can't make a non-granulating paint into a granulating paint just by mixing color. So those types of pigments are really important to add to a palette if you want to have more texture. Now most of this video is going to be real time and I thought about speeding this up but I just assumed that this is mostly going to be for artists to look at so I wanted to give you guys a really good look at how these colors turned out once they were dried because sure I mean like watching me paint a bunch of swatches it's interesting to a certain point but the paints do look different once they're dry. I don't know maybe it'll help you decide on what colors you might be interested in. And I'm going to just, I guess, give some comments on what I think about some of these colors and things that I noticed. So I started with the blacks. Lamp black versus ivory black. Ivory is a little bit of a warmer black, where lamp black I feel is more of a true, neutral, non-colored. It's not blue, it's not warm. It's one of those, like, so... I personally don't go for either lamp or ivory like either one of those is fine for me I do notice the difference but when I'm mixing colors there's not a huge difference I would say in which one you use now Payne's gray and any of the grays though really makes a big difference Payne's gray is very cool it's more of a blue color than either of the blacks and then we have neutral tint which I kind of like to use a lot more than I do Payne's Gray. Uh, I use neutral tint more than black when I'm mixing a darker color, just so I don't get a pure black accidentally or too, something too close to black. But the neutral tint really complements a lot of the colors I use because I do use a lot of greens and blues. Bloodstone Genuine is a new one. So this one, it looked like it was supposed to be red, but I feel it's more on the side of black, but with a red tone to it. And it's also a very flat color and quite a bit um, granulating. Any of the colors that say genuine to them mean that they're literally like crushed rocks. Like <laughs> So those are usually your granulating colors. Ultramarine Violet is one that's M-gram. I'm not a huge fan of it because it's not very strong, so I end up mixing a lot of my own purples. Uh, amethyst Genuine is crushed up amethyst. You can't quite tell in the video, but there's a little tiny bit of sparkle to it, and it's also granulating. It's not a very strong color, but it is still a very pretty um, toned down purple. I was attempting to get the shine to show through, but not enough light, I don't think. Rose of Ultramarine, I think I'm going to add this because it is so cool, the blue that's just hiding inside of there. It's like this rich like kind of wine red, but it's really granulating and there's this blue that pokes through and it makes a really nice light pink. So I think I might be adding that to my palette. Same with Shadow Violet. It's kind of like a purple gray with a little bit of pink that comes through and it's really gorgeous. And it makes almost a dark, it's not black, but like a dark purple gray. I might also add Moon Glow. You can see which ones I'm leaning towards here, right? So Moon Glow is a little bit more purple than the Shadow Violet, and it has a little bit more blue and pink that shows through it. 
Next up are the blues. So Indian Throne Blues, this one I'm holding here. And this is my favorite blue so far. I use this and I mix it with Alyssa and Crimson and it makes a gorgeous, deep, rich purple. This is a new one. I've never had French Ultramarine before, but it is bright. Holy cow. I've never worked with a blue that was this bright. I may or may not add that. I'm not quite sure yet. There are two Prussian blues because one is M. Graham and one is Daniel Smith. And the reason I did both is because I wasn't sure if either of them was going to look a little bit different than the other. And it could have just been the way that I mixed it, but I did both just to make sure there wasn't any difference. So here I'm comparing Prussian blue and Indian throne blue. You can see that Indian throne is a little bit more on the purpley side. Again, I have M. Graham and Daniel Smith of the Cerulean Blue. I really, really like this blue, um, especially for skies. It's pretty much my go-to color when I'm starting out a sky, uh, or water as well. Indigo is a new one for me. It's a very dark blue. It is not a very rich or bright blue. It's definitely toned down, but it's, it's really pretty. Cobalt teal is one I've been using. It's also a granulating one, and I use this one a lot for a lot of my waterscapes. The reason I used this one rather than mixing my pigment is it has something in there that was, I couldn't quite get mixed correctly on my own. Ultramarine turquoise, I went a little bit dark on that one accidentally, but oh gosh, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous color. And I picked up another turquoise, Thalo turquoise, and to compare them, I would say they're rather similar. Ultramarine is a little bit on the green side, where Thalo is a little bit more on the blue side. Because these two are so similar, it's one of those where I don't necessarily need both. I could just take Thalo and add a little bit of green to it, and I could basically get... I could add this green right here, Thalo cyanine. <laughs> if I added this green to the Thalo blue, I could, or Thalo turquoise, I could get the ultramarine turquoise. So those two I don't think I would necessarily need in my palette at the same time. Cascade green on the other hand, it's interesting because it's a very flat green, but it kind of turns blue when you water it down and it has these specks of uh, brown that show up in it once it starts to dry. So it's a sort of granulating color and it almost has three different colors in one. Uh, so I'm really tempted to add this one. Deep Sap Green is one I haven't had. And I was curious to compare this one to a regular Sap Green because I have regular Sap Green. So I think I'm grabbing it here and you can get a good comparison of the two. So I use regular Sap Green, the one on the right and deep sap green is one that I just picked up. What I would honestly do in this case is I might try to mix that sap green with one of the gray tones, maybe like a neutral tint or Payne's gray to try to get the other darker one, but I'll play around with that to see if I can't mimic that color. This one again is kind of like the same scenario where I could probably take other greens and mix it down to reach that color. A little bit redundant if I were to add that. Undersea Green is one that I have had in my palette and I love it. I love this color so much. It's another one of those granulating colors. It starts out green and it turns more on um, like a creamy uh, brown side when you water it down. I also have Serpentine Genuine in there, and again, you could just take Sap Green and basically add a little bit more yellow to it to get this color, but because I use a lot of greens in my palette, I don't mind having a few extra variations just so I don't have to continually mix colors that I use a lot. Opera Pink is crazy bright and vivid. Oddly enough, it's not very light fast, probably because of how bright it is, but I realized that Alizarin Crimson is also only a light fastness of three, so, and then Permanent Rose, so there's something in the reds. The reds seem to break down a lot as far as their light fast reading goes, so it must just be 
a difficult color to keep bright and vivid over time. Permanent Rose, I do use that one a lot. I love it. Cadmium Red is like your basic fire engine red. It's like the purest red you could possibly get. It's funny that I have a lot of reds now, but I don't really use a lot of reds. I think I was just maybe finding, trying to find a new one that I would like. I do like Alizarin Crimson though. Like I mentioned before, I mix this color with Indian Throne Blue to create gorgeous, gorgeous deep purples. I also grabbed Permanent Alizarin Crimson and I haven't tested too much um, about how the permanent colors compare with the non-permanent ones, but I have it so maybe later I'll play around with it some. So Quinacridone Coral is a lighter red that's on the orange side. I do have this one in my palette because I like to mix it with yellow uh, to make like a sunset color of orange. And I do have uh, Azo Orange, which is one that I was recommended to start out with. I do use it a little bit, but I kind of prefer to mix my orange because I don't use it a lot, if that makes sense. Hansa Yellow Deep is a really, really good starter color because it is a nice dark yellow, but it also turns into a nice bright yellow. When I went to the Daniel Smith store, I picked up Hansa Yellow Light thinking, well, it would be a lot brighter and it is very much of a bright lemony color. So I can see either of these being good. You could take the light color and add a little bit of orange to it maybe to like darken it up, but either one of those is fine in my opinion. The Nickel Azo Yellow is really nice, very much of a earthy kind of rusty tone. The Rich Green Gold is a new one for me, and I was curious about this one because the sample that I saw at the Daniel Smith store seemed to have a lot of really cool variation to it, and I didn't feel like I really accomplished that in mine, my swatch, but yeah, so Yellow Ochre, it's kind of like as if you mixed a Yellow Ochre into a green color. It's kind of like those two together. Raw Sienna, a classic. Burnt Sienna, another classic. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's like a landscape thing, but Raw Sienna, Burnt Sienna, Raw Umber, and Burnt Umber are kind of like four colors that every palette I've ever had, um, it was in, they were included in. And Yellow Ochre as well. They're all very natural colors, so if you do a lot of landscapes, it would totally make sense. Burnt Sienna is more on the red side. Burnt Umber is just more of a darker uh, toned down brown. Actually, you know, when you compare Raw Umber with Burnt Umber, then the Burnt looks so much more, more warmer. <laughs> and then I have a few of the brownish reds that were mixed into this group because I wasn't sure. They didn't fit into the red reds. Piemontite Genuine, another crushed rock one, which is awesome. Really beautiful, dark, burnt red color. It turns into like a, not a pink when it's lightened up, but it does have some granulation in there, which is amazing, and sort of like these darker gray specks that appear once it dries. Garnet Genuine. Garnets are interesting because I always thought they were like some sort of really fancy gem, but then you see it like just crushed up in paint. It's a really pretty color. It does not have a whole lot of granulation. Most of that texture is just the paper itself, so I was a little bit surprised on that one. This last section are the duochromes, and these are where on the white they will look like one color, and over black they will look like another, and over the black it's basically the mica that is showing up more than the base color. So the duochromes think of it like two different colors. So this one is pink and like a purple color. I love these for adding into paintings. They're really difficult to reproduce um, like when I take it in to get scanned, but they're perfect for when I make like my limited edition prints. I always paint the duochromes back onto the prints, so the shiny parts are still there. Oceanic is really nice because it's like, it reminds me of like the ocean but with seaweed. And maybe that's not attractive to a lot of people, but I find that really pretty. Or maybe like seashells or something, but like green ones. 
Seguro Green. This one is so cool. It's like a rusty brown pigment base, and then the mica part of it is a bright green. Watercolors aren't necessarily meant to be applied pure thick paint though, so the top part of the little swatches aren't really what they're supposed to look like. Um, I would say more in that middle gradient area is kind of like the thickness you would go with these. Emerald though, holy cow, this paint is solid. Like it can cover some area if you need it to. And it is a emerald, well, you know, it's a green base, a greenish blue base, and a the same color of mica. So I grabbed the oceanic so you can see the two base tones versus the two mica colors that are added to it. You can get so many cool effects with these and I just love shiny things and I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't not get more of these. Sunstone's a really beautiful one too. I feel like the the paint when it's solid, it feels more of a gold color, but it's a very warm gold. So when you water it down and you get to like a really light color, it turns like a very warm cream color. Like a tan maybe. Copper is another one that is a very solid color if you want it to be solid. Also works really, really nicely over black, I've noticed. So I can imagine iridescent copper being very, very good for some just thin detail work to add a little bit of shine to the painting. Russet is sort of the same um, effect as copper, uh, but it is more of a red. So that's pretty much it on that. Everything else is pretty much the same, has the mica, nice shiny bits to it. And of course, sapphire. I love blue, so when I saw this, I was like squealing with joy the entire time I painted this little swatch because that color alone is just so nice to look at. I feel like this would be really cool on like little fish scales or something. That is it, everyone. If you made it through that and you listened to me ramble on, kudos to you. If I glazed over anything or I missed anything and you have questions, do not hesitate to throw them down below and I will do my very best to answer them. Um, again, I'm not like a super specialist for watercolor. I'm not like a representative of Daniel Smith or anything like that. I just happened to be near Daniel Smith's store and I couldn't keep my hands off growing my collection of watercolors so this is where we're at uh oh yeah and then after everything dried i kind of did my best to organize all of the swatches in some sort of chromatic order and then i put them all in the ring and now i can refer to those swatches whenever i'm not sure about a color to use i hope this video helped you out and you got something out of it so yeah thanks for watching everyone and i will see you in the next video bye